welcome to another Out of Spec podcast episode. You join me and Tommy from ChemPower again. And today we're talking about ChemPower and charging reliability. It's no secret that in the U.S. we deal a lot with poor charging experience due to failed chargers, failed backend software, you name it, we got the issues. And with ChemPower now breaking into the U.S. market with a factory going into North Carolina with their units already installed in the North American landscape, we talked about that on the previous episode. I want to hear about what ChemPower is doing to make chargers reliable and have a proven track record in some of the harshest climates on the planet. So, Tommy, thanks for joining again. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kyle. This is, this is, again, a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. So tell us a little bit about, you know, ChemPower's past and maybe the design philosophy to make reliability a part of the chargers from day one. What did you guys do? What did you plan for? Uh, because you're in primarily the Nordic markets right now are huge amounts mm. of ChemPower units. And that's like not an easy market to operate in and maintain high reliability. So what's going on here, sir? Yeah, I think it comes from the heritage as well. Uh, it's our background of, of being born in a family company making welding equipment with open design, which are working in very harsh environment with metal dust and everything. And they are like a pressure washable electronics and a lot to use it outdoor use. I, I think it's a lot of the charger manufacturers are coming like from the clean indoor environment into the harsh outside world. So one of the, or let's say a lot of the design principle are heritage based as well, that you know how to build electronics for house environment. Not to mention, of course, Finnish weather, maybe you can see the snow outside, but this is not a warm and friendly country, but we are now also all around the world, like having charters in Australia or anywhere in the warm. So it's, of course, something that you need to have a, have a solution that fits, fits everywhere. And challenges are different. The heat is another thing, and then the cold and moisture is, a, is another thing. But you need to know how to handle. And on the design point of view, we also made everything modular. Everybody talks about modular design, but it's also we made it so that it's easy to change. That if something would fail, it's easy to change afterwards and, and share the power and make sure that the whole system doesn't fail you. So this is. You know the disparate situation we arrive with an empty battery somewhere and nothing works so it's it's also key that you have a way to have choose there and if there would be a failure there would be a little bit more time but the system would still work that's that's the idea right and, so essentially what you're saying is if something were to fail in the charging cabinet itself and I, i'll back up here in a little bit but let's say you know the way chem power works is you have a charging cabinet with a whole bunch of satellite dispensers around and they're all modular and interlinked. So if one car is only pulling a hundred kilowatts, you can send more power to others. But if they're pulling, you know, 250, you might bring everyone down a bit. It's a really cool way to maximize the grid level connection at the site. But uh, you're saying if, if a small component of the charger itself fails, so that could be a module, the whole mm. unit isn't brought offline. Yeah, exactly. This is kind of kind of the idea of, of having a redundancy in, in the work that you, you have uh, enough capacity to at least feed the power, so-called limp mode. But it's, uh, of course, not a situation where you want to be. And that's why we're also looking at it from the remote monitoring, remote diagnostics being connected all the time. And I, I think we have a great team who is working with, uh, let's say, cloud backend of our own for the system for exactly the way or to, to know what, what's happening. And uh, in this interesting time that you have more and more EV models coming to the market, uh, not everything is perfect also from the car side. They not, might not meet, match the standards. And it's easy way to fix. And it's having the charging control in own hands. Yeah, I think we see that as a core competence, that you have to own the tech and understand. And we have made the self also the software that talks with the car so adjusting that, uh, if you start getting problems in the field uh, with the certain car models, for example, the new car models or a software update on the car, you cannot, let's say, deal with that situation unless you have a system that actually analyzes the charging. And I, I don't know if 
Today, I don't know anybody else who also can, let's say, recognize the car types from the charging curves. So we are building the database. Even with the new cars, it, uh, the system starts the grouping the cars. Even the group that has, doesn't have a name yet, but it will be named as soon as we find out what car it is. But it starts grouping the cars. And you know that this group has something of an issue, that these cars are failing. And we have been even talking directly to the car manufacturers then if, if there is to find out if, if they can do something or we have to adjust the software. And this was, uh, I, I think, a key also when we started working with bigger vehicles. When you go to truck industry, you go to mining vehicles or new, new manufacturers coming into play, there might be actually issues that you are helping the manufacturer solve because you have enough information. The database of charging curves is all the time accumulating in, in our backend. So we get the global data of cars charging and also learn, learn from that. That's amazing. That is so cool. And, and, you know, many of the reliability issues that we actually see out in the field are down to software. The hardware could be working absolutely perfectly, but we have interoperability issues, especially when a new car launches, like you were saying, we start to see weird behavior throughout. We even have issues where handshakes just sometimes fail at random. Uh, or mm. payment processing doesn't work. So what you're saying is not only are you monitoring to make sure that the charger is online and working, but you're actually looking at the behavior of that charger throughout the charging session and see if it matches up perfectly with the car. Yeah. And then there's some algorithm that runs and says, hey, we have an issue here. And then it sends it to your desk. Is that, am I kind of right there? Yeah, yeah, it's normally, but the typical failure is like you said, that the handshake fails with the new cars. If there is certain uncompatibilities the ccs handshake is is a bit complicated because it has to take account all the safety measures times uh have to make sure that the car is ready and and there is a lot of discussion between the charger and uh, and and the car so this is something of i could say an expertise of our company as well i know everybody is not uh, let's say making it the hard way that doing everything yourself but we we saw that this is a key thing to understand and, and also to see that uh, so many new cars are coming to the market and so many new manufacturers are coming there. And as you know, that uh, CCS standards is a good that we have a standard in the world, but it has quite wide ranges um, on, on the spec. So there might be a timing issue that some test is not completing as fast and then the car manufacturer has set another limit. And we might have exactly like the standard is saying, and you have to find how, how it works. We sometimes also had a joke in the beginning that you, you want to fill, fulfill the standard as 100% or do you want to charge the cars? So this is kind of, a, it's a, yeah, that, that, that's the real. Yeah, I thing. love that. That's really, but that's so true because we've seen issues when, for example, XC40 Recharger Polestar launched back then. This was a big one in the U.S., because their units really did not play nicely with almost any of our chargers. And the car manufacturers really had to go back and fix those particular cars and get them adapted to ours. And they still don't charge on some of our DC fast chargers here in the US. It's very weird, uh, those cars in particular. But and I think also the, what, what you refer in there that you have the early deliver chargers that might not be uh, updatable over the air and, and and this is an issue that's why you have to have the modern charters which you can do the work and do the remote work and yes. it, it was also the one part of the story I, I don't think if, if COVID had anything positive but we were actually growing during that time and it's most of the company's time has been during the COVID and you had the problem you couldn't send engineers in the field when you are in different countries you have a lot of rules you cannot travel so we even commissioned our big first bus sites with uh, 94 fast charges in a single site on a remote basis. It was not easy, but we learned a lot from that exercise as well, that how you can do things remotely and you get faster and faster and more, more, let's say, competency in this. So how would that work between the conversation between the charge point operator and you? Obviously, the charge point operator owns, buys, and manages the equipment when you have to deploy new software to it or you want to get data back from it, um, are you able just to log in and fix your chargers or do you have to call up the charge point operator and say, hey, we're about to make these changes or we want this data or how does that conversation work? 
yeah, of course, it, we don't own the charge point anymore. So, of course, it needs, needs to be the software rollout is controlled by the owner of the charge point. We can make recommendations, but of course, you cannot log into a, a product you have already sold to somebody else. So, yeah, up to the latest point, but it, it's also about the software updates. We made it in a modern way that kind of like the software downloads in the background uh, and you, then the CPO can actually decide when they want to want to get it into use. Oh, that is really cool. And so you can always return the older version. So it doesn't delete the old version. So if there was something wrong, you can also just return to the old one and continue. So this wow. was also thought, out, thought that if there something happens in the software update, that you can always return the old one. So the and, system's and, always and, running two or three different updates or two or three different software. Or it, it, it can time. have the newest is in the background and you can bring it on, but you can also return to the old one if, if, if there is some need for that, just for the sake of, let's say, reasonability. Wow, that's huge. That is massive. Because every time, let's say, a CPO wants to deploy an update to the charger, if they're smart, in my opinion, they would deploy it to a local site to where the engineers are. They would bring all of the cars they have for internal testing, try it out, try and confuse it. And then if it passes their tests, they would deploy it out to the mass infrastructure. What we find, though, is most charge point operators will just deploy software without thinking or testing and then it leads to poor customer experience if it's not working. They can yeah. deploy software and monitor all the chargers in real time and say, oh, wow, there's actually a weird bug here. Let's go back. And then they yeah. could call you up and say, can you adjust this? Yeah, exactly. And, and basically, it's also not possible to update software if you have cost charging. So you have to know that as well. So, And, and maybe the... CPO is the best one to decide when the device goes offline for the update that you don't have, let's say, you are making a publicity event and then suddenly the software starts updating. So it's, it's not, uh, not a good, good thing. So like I said, we don't touch the settings if, if, if there is not a permission from the owner. Do you know how long that update takes? Depends on the, on the, on the size, but it, it's in some minutes. It, oh, it's not okay. that. Okay. Because the download part is already done. So that's also because you have downloaded the software pre beforehand, then you just update. So if you also need to wait for the download at the same time, that would be more minutes. To... Right. But so this way you get everything ready to go while cars are charging, while the site's in use. Yeah. And then as soon as it's empty or there's, you know, it's like two o'clock in the morning, you can take it off for a few minutes and do an update. Yeah, correct. That's smart. That's smart. So so the software side sounds pretty solid, but what about the hardware? And I want to talk a, a little bit about the user input hardware, the stuff that can't be engineered or I should say maybe fixed over the air. You have um, a physical unit that a customer is interacting with in the public, that cables mm -hmm. are going to be thrown on the ground. Uh, you know, people don't treat equipment nicely. What about your solution makes it maybe a bit more reliable from a hardware perspective that is user interactability or interactable compared to maybe what's out on the market today? Of course, when we look at the, like the charging cables, it's uh, from a usability point of view, we saw that the car manufacturers are not agreeing where the socket is. So you have to actually fix that on the charger side. So having the spring-loaded connection there that we also take part of the weight away from the users because they might get when the power goes up the charging cables get heavy and you have to support the user and especially if you have like we have a six meters again i don't know what that's in that's in feet because uh, that doesn't really ring a bell for me but uh, uh having a long distance that you can reach every corner of the car is is, is really important but of course, for like uh, the plastic connect of CCS breaking, you have to have regular intervals that somebody goes and check it as well. And this then, do we agree that that CPO responsibility or do we take some kind of maintenance contract? But certain things you have to go and check and report. So this is physical problems. You can see from the data, for example, that uh, maybe the CCS connector is getting old if the temperatures are going up without no reason. But you cannot, everything you cannot remotely monitor. But the main things are there. And this is also one big uh, 
thing that we are doing now first in the in the North American market that we have to get our service partners in line and find the service partners that you can respond to things that happen in the field because you can very easily ruin your reputation if you're not fixing a product that doesn't work. Right. And this is something we've seen uh, a lot of people, a lot of charge point operators, a lot of charging manufacturers struggle with in America is building out the service network because we have such huge landscapes. You know, we run into the service techs at chargers and we're always talking to them and they're like, I was in Minnesota yesterday and now I'm in Texas. And it's like, that's sorry, too much distance for you to go and fix all of these chargers. Yeah. What, what does that look like? Will you be able to say, let's say, you know, X, Y, Z, whoever it is, charge point operator buys 50 chem power stations. They install them across the U S will they have to then train and, and create their service team or does it have to be on you or can it be a mix? What does that look like? It, it's a mix and, and, and it's, it's a normal business of, uh, let's say equipment that, we could take our partner and take our maintenance contract in there, or you have experienced CPOs who have a reliable network. Is at least what happens in, in, in Europe. You have the most experienced one will have their standard partners who can fix anybody's charge that they might have. And, and then in certain situations, we are, for example, working with certain retail chains that actually want to have the charges at the supermarkets. And then this could be that we are doing it as well with our partners. We don't have massive amount of service engineers, but we also, let's say, if there is a more weird situation there, that would be our guy on the field, but that would, might be somebody traveling from North Carolina or, uh, or, right, or somewhere like else. An, an extreme that, would be, that should be quite rare. And that's why we want to also make sure that we have the service network in the US, in the areas we work, because I believe in the, situation that you have to prepare for the worst as well and yeah. have to be able to respond if if you cannot uh, let's say solve it remotely there needs to be a way to do it within a couple of days yeah, so I totally respond agree. And, yeah. yeah and and this is this is something i'm really looking forward to watching and seeing how this plays out and monitoring the stations on our side and of course covering it and i mean you guys have mass experience with already training technicians on how to use your equipment and service your equipment mm -hmm. so that protocol is already built it's not like you have to bring it from the ground up you can just train yeah. americans yeah. to work on the units here which is really intriguing and i actually see from that aspect you as a more uniform market than europe when you there is still one language or so a couple of languages you need to only do in Europe. You have to make your training videos in, in 20 or more languages, which wow. Uh, in Scandinavia and the Nordics, everybody can handle English. But when you go to France, you go to Germany, uh, Italy, the, the people expect get, get everything in their own language. And then that gets more complicated. Uh, <laughs> that is crazy. I didn't even think about that. Um, and, and then we really come down to, I think, the last major point on reliability, which is the biggest one, is the design and engineering and installation process to make sure that the chargers last as long as possible. We sort of talked about what happens when things go wrong up to this point, but how do you engineer your units so that things don't go wrong or at least have a lower chance of going wrong? We've talked a little bit about the modular uh, charging bricks, but maybe there's something about the cooling systems of the chargers or how this works because in the cooling US... Cooling system uh, and, and the know-how how to uh, how to, let's say, protect electronics from the weather. I, I think yeah. this is uh, not so visible from our units, but it, it is something where, where we are we could consider our company group actually to be an expert on to know how to make weatherproof or harsh environment proof electronics it's done years and years. Even Kempower is a young company, but if I look at our sister company working in welding from 1949, and they have been working in an environment where you have metal dust going into electric devices. And so you have to be able to protect the electronics because it's, I think the metal dust is a lot worse than water. And we are dealing actually an easier environment when we go here. So, and there's also other, not just the protecting the electronics, it's how you build the power systems that, you don't allow the water to go in. We, we would actually be more inclined to do even more open designs on the products which standards don't allow because you trust on the capability of protecting the parts 
uh, from from the influence of uh, ambience or atmosphere. Right. Yeah. I mean, we've seen issues with moisture freezing inside of cabinets. So having this moisture control and all of these things are really important. But um, even down to the sound. Oh, actually, the design principle in there is that you have to make the product. So if the water goes in, it also goes out. So mm -hmm. it doesn't stay in the wrong places. So this is actually where the freezing happens. That If your design is so that it's not uh, designed to actually let the water out and lead it out, if it happens, so that's part of the part of the idea there. That I don't actually, I'm not so worried about water getting in, but I'm very worried if the water doesn't come out because that ah. will start creating problems. Wow, interesting. That makes a lot of sense. And you know, one thing that ChemPower has proven over the years of being installed in the Nordic countries and our experience using them deep into the northern parts of the Nordics, um, you work great in the cold. There's no question. I mean, for Colorado, where we are, this is the perfect unit. It's great for that. But what about extreme heat? We get, you know, some of the hottest environments in the world in the U.S. What what did you have to do to design it to handle the temperature differences from the Nordics to the U.S.? I know you have some chargers in Australia. Is it the exact same unit or is there a hot weather version or what does that look like? It is exactly the same unit, but it might be that if you are an extreme hot environment that the unit starts to decrease the power capability because you want to keep everything operating. And of course, we might get warm days in here, which is nothing compared to a desert environment or somewhere, somewhere in a really hot so I, I think it was a less, lessons learned have taught us as well that it's getting getting to acceptable level that now you can really say. But it's not only the hot weather. If I if it would be a good installation, I would always try to find the charger place where you have some shade, because also direct sunlight will start, let's say, heating up the device from the inside. And th this is actually really good that you have this modular design that you can actually place the actual charger in a better location, not on the parking lot, because it's it actually gives the flexibility in the design. Um, right, so you're saying place yeah. the charger under a canopy somewhere away, because yeah. the, the dispensers can handle the heat. They're liquid-cooled yeah. tables. That's not maybe not so big of a deal. The actual charging units get really hot, and that is what can fail due to heat. So if you can place those off-board with a shaded cover, you're saying that can increase its or behind rate. the building, uh, behind the building next to a tree, wh whatever you have, because it's uh, it's not only the heat; it's also direct sunlight will heat up the metal cabinet, and and that's that's something that uh, we have been looking a lot lot as well. And that's hard to specify to say that this much sunlight is okay and this much is not. But uh, let's say having a clever clever site design is. Is a, is a possibility with our, let's say, this kind of a distributed system. It gives a lot more flexibility in the installation. It makes a lot of sense because every summer for the last five years, we've noticed a significant decrease in charger reliability. And actually, as the weather gets colder, maybe our charging speeds go down because the car's batteries are colder. But the reliability seems to be much better in the cold in general than in the heat. And pretty much no chargers that I can think of in America have the actual charging units under cover. They're typically outside mm. uh, in an open field with no shade. So this could be yeah. just an interesting trick that everyone can adopt, especially site planners from CPOs, to put the off-board power cabinets under just any sort of light protection. Yeah, definitely. Definitely so. And I, I think as an electric engineer uh, in studies, I think the heat is an issue for every electric device, and, and it's a lot about the good thermal design, what you right. need to do. How to, how to get heat out, that's how you make the product smaller, whatever electrical device you're talking about. So it's, uh, of course, even you have a high efficiency equipment, there will be losses which are heating up. And then sunlight is an interesting, it, uh, if you would try out the heat that you go in direct sunlight to, uh, to stand in a metal cabinet. I, I think that will be not so nice experience. So, Right. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Um, I know we, we, you know, you have a proven track record from the user base, our enthusiasts, our viewers of having some of the best chargers on the market. I've been so excited for you guys to come to America. 
What do you think about just generally some of our new requirements in the U.S., this 97% uptime? Are you already seeing this level of performance in Europe? Do you even know how they're quantifying this uptime? This, this, your... this, this, is, this would have been my question as well. How do you quantify the uptime? But yeah, I think it's uh, we do have similar numbers and it's even higher if you go in public transportation. In a cities which are relying electric bus transportation, I think you are talking about even 99 or 98. And also response time for if something breaks, you have maybe two hours time to actually respond because city might stop. If you're relying completely in a, in a public transportation system, nothing happens if, if you fail, fail in that. And uh, that's even more, let's say, critical. And I, I think when we look at uh, the trucks moving in the electric world as well, you will have uh, logistic companies who are really concerned about the time of transportation. And when it starts to, let's say, affect your your uh, invoicing and bills, it, it's, it gets gets really critical in there. And the, the demands for uptime is, is even higher. How you define a public charging uh, uptime? I, I would like to see the definition as well. I, I'm also very keen on how do you calculate and, and, and what do you are. I think it's more or less that you have to promise something and then you have to prove it. But I, I think there is not a standard way how to define it yet. Right. I agree. This is why I'm, I'm a little bit weirded out or concerned about this 97% NEVI number because there's so many excuses and we don't, we're not really sure how this will play out. But one thing we can be sure of is that ChemPower builds some of the best freaking units out there. I mean, you guys, I've used your chargers in extreme conditions. We know cities rely on them. Actually, Tommy, tell me if I'm wrong, but isn't ChemPower one of the only saltwater approved charging dc fast charging units where you can put them at a boat dock and charge electric boats oh yeah 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 but it's also the one part of the story is having the satellite versus the power unit away because we also don't have the actual charger by the south border that's right somewhere a little bit further away and and then, then you can actually have our satellites which are mostly aluminium and 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 to have a also the dock side also to the sea side because it gives you also the flexibility of having the critical component away from salty water. Right. You have a lot of parts in there which can have, and then we can deliver a stainless steel version. But even stainless steel doesn't like salt water. So right. you better move that away. It was one part of why we did the outer covers of the, of the satellites are aluminium, because that's better for the corrosion proof. It's pretty amazing because I've seen some photos of you guys like mounted charging boats, and I'm like, how, how is this just not going to rust in, in five minutes? So it's mm. pretty cool. Yeah, it, it is. It is. And I think the boating industry will follow one time. I, I think the like a private people's boats will be first, but we're also looking at the bigger vessels moving in. I, I was years and years in that market as well, but it was always hybrids. Right, uh, right. And it still is if you look at the bigger boats. But I think the electrification of boats is is coming also. It's some years after the cars, but it's there. That's it's amazing. There. So uh, I think one final question just to wrap this up, because I know we've gone on, but I'm, I'm really curious about the American rollout uh, of, and keeping on this track of reliability is in Europe, you're now charging. I've seen ChemPower charging electric trucks, mining equipment, heavy duty stuff left and right. Uh, public transport, like you had mentioned, cities that rely on buses. Mm. In the U.S., have you had these conversations yet where you might be powering these infrastructure critical components? Uh, funny to mention, I, I think first North American deliveries were going underground in Canada. But this is, uh, uh, I think those were the first charges, but you cannot, uh, let's say, go there and charge your electric uh, personal car. Uh, right. <laughs> but it, it is kind of, this is also our goal. And I, I think we see especially the trucks, it might be even faster movement than, than in Europe. Oh, we wow. see a lot of, let's say, interest in the in the logistics. The last mile first, you have the local deliveries will be moving first, but also the long haul. It's very interesting to see how what happens. Um, and I, But I also looking at the truck manufacturers, it's a high interest in, in looking at the US the transportation mm. of goods. Yeah, very interesting. Well, in, in, in our side in Europe, I, I think the 
we can call the electric bus already quite a standard way in Europe. Right. But, uh, I think in soon we have more than 50% all over Europe is, is that all the buses will be electric. The new ones are already going on. We have countries like Netherlands where you have over 70% of the new buses is already electric. Hmm, and interesting. That's, that's not so much to talk about the CO2 emissions, which everybody's talking about the green, let's say this green transition. People are so concerned about having the small particle emissions inside the cities and where the people live. This is also one part of this last mile logistics and, and buses moving to electrification that you remove these uh, particles or NOx emissions which are harmful for people and get the air more cleaner, in, especially in big cities. This is a big topic. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, for me, I don't want to be walking down the street and get a face full of diesel or anything. But here in America, this is still not so much the conversation. But it will come. And uh, I think we're right on the beginnings of trying to think about maybe cleaner emission zones. It's just, unfortunately, yeah. not. Yeah, not I, I think if, uh, you might want to talk about people living close to Los Angeles Harbor and then think about what's the, you know, it's where the people live close by the, that this heavy duty equipment is. I think it, it's a, also quality of life and, and the health issues that you want yes. to address with this change. Totally. And I, I couldn't be more excited about it. So electric buses, electric uh, big trucks, mining equipment really is cool because you can charge underground. I didn't even think about that. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So, so many cool possibilities here. I think about people working in a mine and about the cost of, uh, we, I talked with a mining company. They said that they move more air in weight than they move the actual ore they are right. mining because you need to remove the air that to make the let's say environment safe to work and these electric vehicles are actually fixing the issue you have to change a lot less air uh, mm. and clean the environment and, and also that's a perfect application for evs yeah totally is wow who would have thought about that that is so cool and um i'm really looking forward to seeing chem power installed all over north america trying them out using them seeing how they perform in real life if Europe's anything to go by, I can say we only have uh, the utmost confidence. I mean, I think this is could be the savior to America that we're looking for, for reliable uh, charging infrastructure. So, Tommy, I can't thank you enough for joining on another podcast. We have uh, plenty more to do together between uh, Out of Spec and ChemPower. But what a cool experience learning about the history of your company. And last, this final ending was nice. No, no pressure. So just saving the America. But yeah, we are up for the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's true. We really need the help here. I mean, there's our our infrastructure has been, you know, maybe worst in the best case scenario. It's been terrible. And so having this proven reliable uh, hardware to come here with a good software package is kind of the perfect sauce to what we've been needing. So I hope it all works well in practice. We'll be keeping our eyes on it. You'll be seeing all the rate your charge check-ins. And uh, yep, thanks so much, Tommy. We'll see you all on Thank another you. one soon. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.